Hungarian folk tales. The soldiers look. Once upon a time, there lived a soldier. The soldier was returning home on leave from the army and passing through the forest when an old witch appeared and blocked his path. Would you like to have wealth and riches, young man? Of course, for I do not have a penny to my name. Then listen to me. You must go to the hollow tree and summon up all the money you desire. But you can only make money magically appear if you grant me one wish. Just tell me what you wish, old lady. There are three barrels of coins down there, but each is guarded by a fearsome hound. I shall give you an apron, and once you get down there, you must spread it on the ground and place the dogs on it. When you have collected all the money you want, you will look for a box on the table and you must bring that box to me. Now I shall tie this rope around your waist and lower you down, and when your task is complete, I shall pull you back again. The soldier looked at the coins in the first barrel, but they were all copper. I don't want these, he said, set the dog back on the pile and carried on. The second barrel contained silver coins, he said, I don't want these either. The third barrel was filled with gold coins, so he placed the dog on the apron and filled all his pockets with gold. Then he picked up the magic box from the table and called to the old witch to hoist him back up. So tell me, witch, why do you want this little box? But the old witch could not tell him, so he slit a throat with his silver sword. Then the soldier went on his way. Soon he reached a town where he bought himself good food and new clothes. Then he hired a coach and rode through the town. And as he rode, he showered the townspeople with money. He gave money willingly because he knew what it was to be poor. Then he rented a room at the local inn where he made merry every night. But the day eventually came when he ran out of money and had neither bread nor candles. Then he recalled that the little box from inside the hollow tree had a candle in it. The soldier lit the candle and the first fearsome dog appeared. What is your wish, master? I've run out of money. I have neither bread nor anything else. Then the dog hurried off and soon returned with a bag brimming full of money for its master. The young soldier soon received news that there was a young princess living in the town, but that no one was allowed to visit her in person. The soldier soon set his heart on seeing her. So he lit the candle and the dog appeared. What is your wish, master? I hear there is a princess whom no one is allowed to see. How could I possibly see what she's like? She's said to be very beautiful indeed. Then the dog went off without saying a word and soon returned with the princess. The royal maid went to the princess's room in the palace and discovered that she was gone. As soon as she realized, she began to scream. Everybody asked, where can she have gone? Where can she have gone? The king said, if she comes back, a maid should sit by the side of her bed and watch over her at night and see which way she goes should she leave. So when the princess was back in her room, a maid sat by the side of her bed. The next night, when the dog took her away, the maid ran after them but failed to note the number of the house and so didn't know where the dog had taken her. I know what to do, the king said. So he filled a bag with flour, cut the corner off the bag and tied it to the princess's waist. So wherever the dog took her, the flower trail betrayed them. 
The next day, soldiers followed the flower trail and it led them directly to the young soldier. The king was furious and sentenced the young soldier to death for what he had done. All the people of the town gathered to see the execution. Then a young boy happened to pass right in front of the soldier's prison cell window and the soldier said to him, Where are you going, young lad? I'm going to see the execution of some soldier. Go no further. I'm that soldier. Go back quickly. He told the lad where exactly. And bring me the box you'll find on the table. The young boy went off, brought the box and passed it to him. So when he was led to the gallows, the soldier told the hangman that he had one last wish. The king allowed the soldier to smoke a pipe. Then the soldier lit the candle in the box three times and all three dogs appeared. What is your wish, master? What's my wish? Can you not see I am about to be hanged? So then the three dogs set upon the crowd, but they were careful not to harm the pretty princess. Then the soldier married the princess and they both lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, very far away, there lived a very poor man. He was as poor as could be and had nothing to his name. His name was Starving Matthias, for he had nothing to eat. One day Matthias made up his mind to go into the forest and hang himself. He looked hard at all the trees to see which one would be best for the job. And as he was busy doing this, the devil appeared before him and asked, What are you looking for, Matthias? I'm looking for incense to smoke you out of hell. This frightened the devil so much that he promised to give Matthias anything he wanted. Then give me 200 pounds of gold. And so the devil gave him what he wanted. Matthias returned home very contented. The devil also went home and told the other devils what had happened. The other devils told him that 200 pounds of gold was far too much and thought how best to get it back. Then one of the devils had a very simple idea. I shall simply go and ask him to give it back. So the devil went to him and said, 200 pounds of gold is really far too much. So I suggest the strongest between us should take it as a prize. I challenge you to a fight. I won't fight you, devil. I'll simply throw you to the ground so that you'll never get up again. But my grandfather is 188 years old and lives deep in the forest. You should go and fight him instead. So the devil and Matthias went to the forest where Matthias told the devil to enter a cave. So the devil went in and what do you think he found? A bear. But the devil didn't know it was a bear. The bear was lying on the ground and so the devil woke it up. The bear was far stronger, but the devil managed to slip from the bear's grip and hurry away home again. Then the devils gathered for a second time to discuss how best to get the 200 pounds of gold back from starving Matthias. Next, the fastest devil went to see Matthias. Matthias, the 200 pounds of gold is far too much, so let's see which one of us can run faster and he shall have the gold. I won't compete against you, because if I start running, I'll be so fast that I'll knock down the walls of hell. But I have a son called John, who will run fast against you. Come with me to the forest, because that is where John takes his midday nap. Matthias knew exactly in which bush the rabbit hid. Wake up, John, wake up and take a race against the devil. 
The rabbit heard this, jumped to its feet and began to run as fast as the wind. The devil gave chase. But by the time the devil reached the forest, there was no sign of the rabbit. Who would have thought that your son could have run so fast? And with that, the devil walked back to hell. The devils gathered again to discuss the matter and then the strongest of them said, this time I shall go and bring back the gold. So he went to see Matthias and said to him, 200 pounds of gold is far too much. The one to win the gold will be the one of us who can carry the horse six times around the yard and rest no more than three times in total. This challenge worried poor Matthias because he knew the horse was far too heavy for him. Then he had a thought and said to the devil, you do it first and then I will follow you. So the devil lifted the horse and carried it around the yard six times, but by the time he was done, the devil was absolutely exhausted. Then Matthias said to the devil, the way you lifted the horse and carried it around was really no great deed and you even stopped to rest. Now I shall take the horse between my legs and take it nine times around the yard without stopping even once. When Matthias dismounted, he spoke to the devil and said, You see, I am much stronger than you are. Although I took the horse between my legs, I had no need to take a rest. Defeated, this devil went home again. Once back, the devils discussed how they would regain the gold. At last, a devil stepped forth, saying that he would bring back the gold. So off he went to see Matthias. 200 pounds of gold is far too much, so the one of us who can scare the other more shall have the gold. We'll have you drink hot ink today. I'll drink it. What if we harness you to a yoke and have you plough smouldering embers in hell? I'll do it if I must. What if we put you in a steel pot and pour boiling lead on you? I'll bear it if I must. Now I'll scare you. The devil realised that the man was much braver and so he rushed back to hell and told the others, Beware of starving Matthias. Let him have the 200 pounds of gold rather than perish because that Matthias is a bigger devil than all of us put together. But when he died, he was not let into heaven. Off you go to hell. That's where you belong. You were good friends with the devils down there. So off Matthias went to hell but the devils would not let him in either. Then poor Matthias sat down outside heaven's door and sits there to this day. If you go to heaven, you are sure to see him still. Folk Tales The Witch Once upon a time, there lived an old man who had three sons. When all three were fully grown, they decided to marry and told their father of their wish. Very well, but one at a time. I want you all to take a walk and the one who returns with the prettiest flowers will be the first to marry. The two elder brothers did not even leave the village. Both of them had a sweetheart, so each of them brought a nice bunch of flowers back to their father. The youngest son, however, had no sweetheart, so he went out of the town to look for flowers. He walked and he walked until he eventually came to a vast forest in the middle of which he came across an old palace surrounded by a flower garden. Oh, if only I could pick flowers in this beautiful garden. The youngest son was still standing there when a witch appeared in the garden and asked him, Why are you so sad, my child? Then the young man told her what his problem was. If all you need are flowers, come with me and I shall give you some. Then she took him into the garden and picked a bunch of beautiful flowers. As soon as the poor man caught sight of the flowers, he said to his eldest sons, Well, sons, 
It will be your younger brother who will marry first because he has returned with the best blossoms. But the elder brothers complained to their father so bitterly that he eventually agreed to set a second test. Very well, the second test shall be he who brings back the prettiest kerchief shall be the one to marry first. So the sons went off, the two elder ones to their sweethearts in the village and the youngest one to the witch in the forest. What do you need this time, my child? The youngest son told her and so the old witch went back into the palace and brought the young man a beautiful gold-trimmed kerchief that bedazzled the boy. The two elder brothers also brought a kerchief each, but the youngest son's was by far the loveliest of the lot. The elder brothers were very upset, and so their father eventually agreed to set a third test. Very well, go and bring me your sweethearts. He who brings me the loveliest girl shall be the one to marry first. This was easy for the two elder brothers because they both had sweethearts in the village. But where, oh where, should the youngest brother look for a bride? Who could he take to his father? Should he fetch the old witch who had given him the flowers and the kerchief? So the youngest son set off with his head hung low. He walked into the forest, stopped in front of the palace and leaned against the fence with a face as sad as the autumn rain. What's the matter with you, my child? Oh, don't even ask me what the matter is. My father told us that the son who took the prettiest sweetheart home would be the first to marry. Don't hang your head, my child, but come with me to the palace. Here's a fireplace, make a fire. With every flame that flickers up, a witch will appear before your eyes. Fear not and stand bravely there until you see the last and ugliest witch of all that will have a bunch of keys between her teeth. Then you need to snatch the keys, otherwise the rest of the witches will tear you apart. And now the rest is up to you. Say nothing more, the old witch vanished. The young man made a fire in the fireplace and as the flames began to grow and crackle, a witch emerged from the flames. The youngest son was so afraid that a shiver of fright ran down his spine. Then a second flame leapt forth, producing a second witch. Then many more witches followed this one. Eventually, the last witch appeared with a bunch of keys between her teeth. The youngest son gathered all his courage and snatched the keys and, wonder of wonders, the ugly witch turned into a beautiful princess. The youngest son was too surprised to speak. All the witches then vanished from the room and were replaced by a throng of graceful maidens. Then the pretty princess said, you must be very surprised. I'll have you know that I was the old witch who gave you the flowers and the kerchief. You must have been sent here by God because I was a princess and a spell was cast on me. Had you not appeared, I would have remained an old witch, and now we shall be together for the rest of our natural days. The poor man was in good spirits and said, very well, I will let my elder sons marry too. And that they did. And their younger brother gave them each a house with plenty of land. Then the youngest and most fortunate son took his bride back to the palace where they lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, there lived a bootmaker and a shoemaker. They were both as poor as church mice. One day, the bootmaker said to the shoemaker, Let the devil go hungry now, my friend. If we can't make an honest living out of our trade, let's make money any other way we can. 
So they thought and they thought until they came up with an idea. The shoemaker would lead the judge's six chestnut horses into the forest, tie them to a tree, and the bootmaker would read from an old book, as if it were written there, where the judge could find his horses. But all for good money, of course. That is exactly what they did, just as they had agreed. A search for the horses was launched that stretched far across the land, but to no avail. Then the bookmaker went to see the judge and said to him, How much will you pay me, your worship, if I find you a clue? The judge promised to pay him 300 florins. So the bootmaker took up an old book and began to read it out loud. Up on the snow-covered hillside, in the middle of the thick forest, all the six horses stand tied to a beech tree. That's where they will be found. All the village folk quickly prepared and hurried to the forest where they found the six horses tied to a beech tree. Then the judge happily paid the bootmaker the 300 florins. News of Mr Cricket, for that was the bootmaker's name, spread far and wide across the land. The myth was that he had a magic book and nothing in the world could happen that he could not solve with the help of that book. Eventually even the king got word of this and was delighted by the news as the queen had just lost her favourite ring and had made herself ill with crying. So the king had his royal carriage harnessed with six golden horses and sent off to fetch the bookmaker. He even sent his royal guards with it so that Mr Cricket would come to no harm on the way back. Mr Cricket felt so nervous that he began to shiver and quiver like a willow leaf as he was afraid his deceit would be uncovered. When they arrived at the palace, the king greeted him with great joy. The king immediately set about telling him what had happened. I'll have you know, Mr Cricket, that if you find the ring, I'll give you six carts full of gold. I'll do my best, Your Majesty, although I doubt I shall find it. Then he asked the king to have him locked up in a room so that he could think for three days. And the king willingly complied. He led Mr Cricket into the loveliest room and sent him so much to eat and to drink that the poor man was at a loss where to begin. The first day went by, but Mr Cricket came up with nothing. The second day went by, and the third, and poor Mr Cricket began to lose heart. So he thought to himself that he would count how many courses he was going to have for the last meal of his life. The first servant came in with the first course and Mr Cricket said out loud, here comes the first. The servant was so frightened by this that he almost dropped the plate. He rushed out to the kitchen and said to the cook and the undercook, oh dear, we're done for, that magician knows we stole the ring. Of course, this was true. Indeed, it had been the servant, the cook and the undercook who had stolen the Queen's ring. They agreed that the second course should be taken in by the cook. And as the cook entered the room, Mr Cricket said, here comes the second. The cook slammed down the plate in great fright and fled to the kitchen. Oh dear, we're done for. I'll see what he says to me, said the undercook and entered with a third course in hand. Of course, the bootmaker said, here comes the third. The undercook was so scared that he fell to his knees in front of Mr Cricket and admitted that the three of them had stolen the ring. Then the servant and the cook ran in and they too fell to their knees, begging him not to tell on them and promised to pay him 300 florins each. Mr Cricket thought to himself that it sounded good enough. Beside the six carts of gold, he had them then produce the ring, which he pushed into a piece of white bread and threw it out of the window, just as the king's turkeys were passing by. One of the turkeys picked it up and swallowed it at once. Mr Cricket was thrilled to inform the king, Your Majesty, I know where the ring is. Have that turkey killed and you will find the ring in its belly. So the turkey was killed, its stomach opened, and lo and behold, the Queen's ring came forth. Then the ring was taken quickly to the Queen. In the twinkling of an eye, the Queen stopped her sobbing and was filled with the joy of the world. The King had six carts filled with gold. Then he had Mr Cricket driven home in the royal carriage 
and his steward and a regiment of soldiers escort him so that no harm could come to all the gold. As they were riding along, an idea crossed the steward's mind, he thought. I'll play a trick on you, you bootmaker magician. So he got out of the coach, spotted a cricket on the ground, picked it up and held it tight in his hand. Then he asked Mr Cricket, Well, if you know so much, tell me what I'm holding in my hand. Mr Cricket scratched his head and finally said, Well, Cricket, you're in a tight corner now. That's right, said the steward. It is indeed a cricket. Your wisdom is endless. Now I know. Once upon a time, a poor young soldier was coming home from the war. The poor soul wandered from one village to another, threadbare and hungry. He was offered no bread or even a little hot soup, anywhere at all. He went from house to house asking for something to eat. But the people either set the dogs on him or told him they themselves were too poor to eat. As he carried on from gate to gate, he made up his mind to go into the first house and make a pot of soup for himself, whoever the owner of the house might be. He picked up a stone at the entrance of a house and walked in. The owner was an old woman. Good morning, old lady. Good morning to you, young soldier. Are you well today, old lady? I am well, and how are you, young soldier? I'm also well. But I have to say that I would love to eat a little soup, if you have any to spare. Oh, young soldier, I'd gladly give you some if I had any, but I'm as poor as a church mouse. I have nothing. My pantry, my attic, and my whole house are all empty. I have nothing, not even a crust of bread. Well, said the soldier, I'm not so poor. I have a stone right here in my pocket. I could make a soup out of it. All I need is a pot or a pan or something to cook it in. Well, I could give you one. I have plenty of pots in the house, said the old woman, but I have nothing to put in them. The soldier washed the stone nice and neatly and placed it in the pot. The old woman lit the fire. The soldier poured water over the stone and placed it on the fire to cook. He even stirred it with a long wooden spoon. The old woman watched him with curiosity. The soldier even tried the soup. Well, it's good enough, he said, but if it had a little salt in it, it would be even better. I'll get you some salt. I have plenty. The soldier put the salt into it, stirred it and said, if you had a spoonful of fat, that would make it even better. The old woman said, I do have some. I'll bring it right away. She brought a spoonful of fat and they put it in the pot. The soldier stirred it and tried it while the old woman watched his every move. The soldier said, Well, you know, I'm used to making stone soup, but I usually make it with a piece of sausage. That gives it a better flavour. Oh, I have some sausage, said the old woman. I'll give you some from the pantry. Then the soldier said, Bring two pieces, so then you'll have one, and I'll have one too. Very well, I shall bring two. And the old woman brought two pieces of sausage. The soldier put them both in the pot, then stirred it and tried it. Do you know, he said, if you have some potatoes, we could cut some up and put them in here too. And if you have some vegetables, that would really top it all. <laughs> Oh, but I do have some, said the old woman, and I'll bring them at once. So she hurried off right away 
pulled up some potatoes and vegetables, which they cleaned and cut into pieces and put into the soup. Then the soldier stirred it, tasted it and said to the old woman, you should try it too, it's really good. The old woman tried the soup and said, well, I would have never have believed that you could make such a good soup from a stone. They left it to cook a while, then the soldier said, a little rice would improve it, but I'm not sure you have any. Oh, but I do have some rice. Then they put some rice into the soup too. Now it's just like the soups I usually make. Then they waited for the soup to be ready and the soldier served the old woman and himself a bowlful each. And they both began to eat. The old woman couldn't help wondering how such a good soup like this had been made out of a stone. When they had had enough to eat, the old woman said to the soldier, Tell me, young soldier, would you sell me this stone? Quite often I have nothing to cook, but with this stone, I would always have at least a little soup. Well, why not? It's yours for 100 florins. The old woman quickly gave him the 100 florins and wrapped the stone from the soup in a cloth so she could use it again to make soup whenever she wanted. Then the young soldier left with the 100 florins before the old woman could change her mind. So he had satisfied his hunger and he had a hundred florins for his troubles. He walked cheerfully on till nightfall when he met another old woman who had no idea how to make good soup out of a stone either. He played his trick again and had a good meal on top of it. And I don't know what kind of soup the old woman made after that as I was told this story by an old aunt of mine. But I suppose they tried it when they were poor back in the old country. But whatever the case, they all lived happily ever after. Hungarian Folk Tales The Prince Who Wanted to Live Forever Once upon a time there was a prince. He told his father that he did not want to die. You should know, son, that he who is born will also die. But the prince insisted that he did not want to die. I'll go to Foreverland. There's no such place, my son. Yes, there is. I've heard of it. Very well, then. Go. The prince prepared himself and wandered for many years until he came to a high mountain. He regarded the mountain and saw something at its very peak. It looked as small as a sparrow. Well, if he had come all this way, he simply had to find out what it was. It took him years to scale the mighty mountain. There he found a huge giant. He greeted the giant, and the giant returned his greeting. What are you doing here, Prince? I'm looking for Foreverland. Could you tell me which way to go? Of course, you've arrived. Stay here with me because the Queen of Foreverland will send you here anyway. I'd like to talk to the Queen myself. Please tell me which way to go from here. There's a large forest over there. If you cross it, you'll find her. The prince went off to find the forest. There he came upon a magnificent palace. And there he found a kindly woman sewing in one of the rooms. What are you looking for, prince? The queen, of course. Well, don't go any further, because she will send you here anyway. Stay with me and we can talk. But I wish to talk to the queen herself. You cannot get in to see her because you have to go through three iron gates and each is guarded by three wild beasts. But if you don't want to stay here, I'll give you three bread buns. Should the animals attack you at the gates, give them a bun and the iron gates will open. And so it all happened. When the third iron gate opened up, the prince saw the queen was standing in the middle of a courtyard. 
she asked the prince what had brought him to her palace. I've come looking for you. Then stay here with me. And the prince stayed. Time went by, and one day the prince said to the queen, Listen, I'd like to go home. I left my old parents behind, and I'd like to see how they are. The queen laughed. Being a prince has not made you any wiser. How many years do you think you've been here? Three years? You've been here for 3,000 years, but I won't keep you from going if you really want to. I'll give you a pair of shoes. Take them with you. A man will attack you. Tell him you'll go with him and then put on these shoes. So the prince set off and he wandered and wandered until he reached a town. But the town was no longer the same as it had been. He asked a few people if they knew the king by such and such a name. No, nobody knew him. He asked the oldest looking man who was the oldest man in town. The man showed him the house where a 300 year old man lived. The prince went to see him. Do you remember my father, old man? Oh, my son. I've never even heard of him. As night fell, the prince found himself a room, made himself a bed out of hay, and went to sleep. In the morning, he woke up with a man standing right in front of him. Hail, prince. I've been looking for you for 3,000 years, and now I've found you. Come with me, because you ought to have died a long time ago. Wait a minute, let me put on these shoes. Let's go out, and then I'll go with you. When the prince put on the shoes, they whisked him away at once. Death rushed after him everywhere, but failed to catch the prince. When the prince reached the walls of the queen's palace, the queen of Foreverland was standing there in the courtyard. She shouted to death. Don't you touch that man. I'll go out and take care of him. I'll throw him up high, and if he falls outside the walls, he'll be yours. But if he falls within the walls, he'll be mine. When the king threw the prince up high, death danced and clapped, thinking that he was going to fall outside. But as it happened, he landed within the walls. The queen then chased death away, telling him never to return to her land again. Otherwise, he would surely die himself. So the prince stayed with the queen, and they both lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, there lived an old woman. And the old woman had one hen and one cockerel. One day, the hen was pecking in the bushes when she found a single slowberry. The hen tried hard to swallow the slowberry, but it stuck in her throat. The hen rushed to the cockerel and asked him to fetch her some water because she was sure she would soon choke on the slowberry. So the cockerel ran to the well and said, Well, give me some water. I'll take the water to the hen because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. The well said, I will give you some water 
if you fetch me a green branch. So the cockerel ran to the tree and said, Tree, give me a green branch. I'll take the branch to the well. The well will give me water. I'll take the water to the hen, because she's sure she will soon choke on the slowberry. The tree said, I will give you a green branch if you bring me a wreath. So the cockerel ran to the wreath maker and said, Wreath maker, give me a wreath. I'll take the wreath to the tree. The tree will give me a green branch. I'll take the branch to the well. The well will give me water. I'll take the water to the hen, because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. The wreath maker said, I will give you a wreath if you bring me a pair of shoes. So the cockerel went to the cobbler and said, Cobbler, give me a pair of shoes. I'll take the shoes to the wreath maker. The wreath maker will give me a wreath. I'll take the wreath to the tree. The tree will give me a branch. I'll take the branch to the well. The well will give me water. I'll take the water to the hen, because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. I'll give you a pair of shoes if you bring me some glue. So the cockerel ran to the cat and said, Cat, give me some glue. Then I'll take the glue to the cobbler. The cobbler will give me a pair of shoes. I'll take the shoes to the wreath maker. The wreath maker will give me a wreath. I'll take the wreath to the tree. The tree will give me a branch. I'll take the branch to the well. And the well will give me water. I'll take the water to the hen because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. The cat said, I will give you glue if you bring me some milk. So the cockerel ran to the cow and said, Cow! Give me some milk. Then I'll take the milk to the cat. The cat will give me some glue. I'll take the glue to the cobbler. The cobbler will give me a pair of shoes. I'll take the shoes to the wreath maker. The wreath maker will give me a wreath. I'll take the wreath to the tree. The tree will give me a branch. I'll take the branch to the well. And the well will give me water. And I'll take the water to the hen, because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. The cow said, I will give you some milk if you bring me some hay. So the cockerel ran to the reaper and said, Reaper, give me some hay. I'll take the hay to the cow, the cow will give me the milk, I'll take the milk to the cat, the cat will give me some glue, I'll take the glue to the cobbler, the cobbler will give me a pair of shoes, I'll take the shoes to the wreath maker, the wreath maker will give me a wreath, I'll take the wreath to the tree, the wreath will give me a branch, I'll take the branch to the well, the well will give me water, I'll take the water to the hen, because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. The reaper said, I will give you some hay if you bring me some bread. So the cockerel ran to the farmer's wife and said, Farmer's wife, give me some bread. I'll take the bread to the reaper. The reaper will give me some hay. I'll take the hay to the cow. The cow will give me milk. I'll take the milk to the cat. The cat will give me glue. I'll take the glue to the cobbler. The cobbler will give me shoes. I'll take the shoes to the wreath maker. The wreath maker will give me a wreath. I'll take the wreath to the tree. The tree will give me a branch. I'll take the branch to the well. And the well will give me water. I'll take the water to the hen because she's sure she will choke on the slowberry. The farmer's wife said, I will give you some bread if you bring me some firewood. So the cockerel ran to the forest, collected some firewood and took it to the farmer's wife. Then the farmer's wife gave him some bread and he took the bread to the reaper. The reaper gave him some hay and he took the hay to the cow. The cow gave him some milk and he took the milk to the cat. The cat gave him some glue and he took the glue to the cobbler. The cobbler gave him a pair of shoes and he took the shoes to the wreath maker. The wreath maker gave him a wreath and he took the wreath to the tree. The tree gave him a branch and he took the branch to the well. The well gave him some water and he took the water to the hen. But by then, the hen had surely choked on the slowberry. His morning was over, he had it announced all over the land 
that he would marry any maiden who could spin yarn of gold. One old woman heard this news and rushed home to her house to tell her ugly daughter. Well, my dear, could you spin yarn of gold out of string? Her daughter set about thinking and soon set her heart on becoming queen. Once, when her mother was away in the village, she shut all the doors, covered all the windows so as not to be seen by anybody, and began to spin yarn. She kept on at it for quite some time, but there was no way she could make yarn of gold out of old string. Oh, I can't go on like this. If someone taught me how to spin yarn of gold, I'd give him my body and my soul, even if he was the devil himself. Here I am, sweetheart. What do you wish? The girl told him what and asked him to teach her how to spin yarn of gold out of simple string. She said she'd give him anything he asked. I'll teach you if you give me your body and your soul in a year from now. The girl agreed. Sit here on this stool with your back to the door like me, you see. Then say three times, Devla, Devla di Suckle. Then the devil began to spin yarn and, believe it or not, yarn of gold came spinning off the spinning wheel. Then the girl too sat down on the little stool with her back to the door and repeated three times, Devla, Devla di Sacco. Then she set about spinning and, miracle of miracles, yarn of gold began to spin off the spinning wheel onto the spindle in her hand. Well, my dear, I'll leave you now, but I'll be back when the year has passed. Do you understand our bargain? I do, I do, but before you go, please tell me your name. I won't do that, but if you can guess, I won't take you away when the year's over. Then the girl carried on spinning until the candles had to be lit. And then her mother came home. Goodness, my dear, is what I see true? Can you really make yarn of gold out of old string? Yes, I can, mother. Hurry right away and tell the king the news. The king found it very hard to believe. Well, your majesty, I swear upon my life it's true. Come and see for yourself. So the king set off to see for himself with six ministers, counts, barons and generals. Not even the old oven had ever seen so many lords of the land gather together before. It stood there gaping with its mouth so wide that it was unable to shut it ever again. Then the king and his lords all sat down and watched how the ugly girl spun yarn of gold out of string. The king was worried that he would have to wed such an ugly girl. But what else could he do? He sent a carriage drawn by four horses to fetch the girl, summoned a priest and married her right away. The king slowly became accustomed to his new wife's looks and soon he no longer saw her as ugly. They lived like this for quite some time, but as the days passed, the poor girl turned queen became sadder and sadder. What will become of me when the year is over? Both the king and the courtiers tried to cheer the queen up, but in vain. Then one day the king went out hunting with his men. He ordered his men to go right up to the top of the hill and set up camp under the largest tree. We have a problem, your majesty. We can't set up camp under the largest tree because a small man shaped like a monster has made a fire there. Maybe we shouldn't go there at all. On the contrary, we'll go and see who it is, even if it's the devil himself. And they reached the top of the hill, and there they saw a fire. And around the fire, a tiny man dancing around a huge pot with an enormous wooden spoon. Burn fire, burn flame, in this pot is what I make, a beautiful bride I will take, and Dan the Dancer is no fake. As the king caught sight of him, he burst out laughing and went straight home to tell his wife so that she could have a good laugh too. And that's just what happened. The queen laughed so much that it seemed as though she had no worries in the world. 
Time went slowly by, and the year she had bargained would soon be reached at noon that day. On the strike of twelve, just as the king and queen were about to eat a delicious bowl of soup, there was a knocking on the door. The queen could guess who it was. Who is it? It's me, sweetheart, the one who taught you how to spin yarn of gold out of string. The year's up and I've come to take you away. If you can say who I am, you can stay. You mean your name? It's Dan the Dancer. And to hell with you. Upon this, the little man burst with rage and slammed against the door and all that was left of him was a big blob of tar. Then the king asked his wife how she knew who the man was. In her great fright, she told him all that had happened. Well, my love, if you can still spin yarn of gold out of old string after this, you can stay. But if you can't, you must leave here and never return. So the woman sat down and said, Devla, Devla, Disako, and she began to spin. But it was no use. No yarn of gold would come off the spinning wheel. The woman had a fit, and in her rage, she flew against the door. There she turned into tar just like the devil. All the shoemakers and bootmakers went there from then on whenever they needed tar. And if I'm not mistaken, they go there still. Once upon a time, there was a poor man. He was as poor as a church mouse. Children, he had many though, but apart from them, he had nothing but a single cockerel. Next door to him, there lived a rich man. He was so rich that he had absolutely no idea of all that he had. His yard was full of hens, cockerels and fine farm animals. It happened one day that poor man Peter's cockerel went over to rich man Paul's yard. The cockerel went over to the hens because he was so bored all alone in Peter's yard. The rich man, greedy Paul, saw this and he said to the poor man, Listen here, Peter, do something with this cockerel. Either kill it or sell it, but get it out of my yard, otherwise I'll batter it and it'll be of no use to you anymore. I don't want it to come over to my yard. Poor man Peter was desperate. What should he do? He thought hard. He'd kill it and cook it for his children, but his children had never eaten meat in their lives before, and they would get used to the taste of meat and want it at every meal. Oh well, he thought, I'll take it to my master and give it to him as a gift. Maybe he will give me something in return. So he did just this. And his master said to him, Hey, Peter, you're a poor man with many children. Wouldn't you have been better off cooking this cockerel for your children at home? No, sir, said Peter, because we're so many at home, there are so many children that one cockerel would never satisfy them all. They'd each just have one bite, and once they had tasted the meat, they'd realise it was better than boiled potatoes or simple soup and they'd never want to eat those things anymore. They'd always want to eat meat. All right, Peter, we'll roast this cockerel for dinner today, but I want you to be here to serve it to us. The master had two sons, two daughters and a wife, so they were six. Peter went to their house at midday when dinner was going to be served. There was the roast cockerel on the table. 
Peter thought hard and began to carve. He reasoned thus, The master and the lady of the house are the head of the family, so I'll cut the head and the neck off for them. I'll give the two wings to the two young ladies so they can fly off with more ease when it comes to marrying. The young masters will get the two feet so they can run better. And I, poor devil, will make do with what is left. This way he himself had the bulk of the cockerel. The master rewarded Peter for his wisdom. He gave him a horse, a cart, a plough and everything to go with it as well as some land to farm as his own. He told him to run his own farm and grow rich on it. Rich man poor got word of this. He was ever so envious. If his neighbour had been given so many things for one single cockerel, how much would the master give him for five cockerels, he wondered. Rich man Paul finally made up his mind to take his five cockerels to the master. He was so envious. He gave them all as a gift. The master said to rich man Paul, Listen here, Paul. We'll roast these five cockerels for dinner today. I want you to serve us at table. If you fail to divide the roast justly, I'll have you whipped 50 lashes. But if you manage to divide it well, I'll reward you richly. The five cockerels were roasted and none was cut up. They were all in one piece. Rich man Paul went to the master's house, but he couldn't divide the meat justly in any way. Then the master said to his servant, Go and fetch Peter. So Peter came. Well, Peter, you'll have to divide these five cockerels among us. Peter thought hard. Well, he said, I've always believed in the Holy Trinity. This time I'll be guided by it too. I reckon the master and the lady of the house and a cockerel will make a trinity. By the same token, he said, the two young ladies and a cockerel will make a trinity. The two young masters and a cockerel also. So I, poor devil, and two cockerels will also make a trinity. This cheeky but shrewd way of dividing the roast made the master and his entire family laugh. The master richly rewarded Peter again and had the rich man Paul whipped as he had pledged. Paul was given 50 lashes and told never to return to the palace again. Hungarian Folk Tales The Princess's Shoes Once upon a time there lived a most beautiful princess who was lovelier than any maiden on earth. Prince after prince came to her father's palace Princes from all over the world surrounded the lovely princess, telling her the sweetest things, but it was no use. It all went in one ear and out of the other. In fact, she laughed at them so loudly that the whole palace resounded to her laughter. There was one among the princes who caught the princess's eye and she took a fancy to him, but he was none the wiser for it as the merciless princess poked even more fun at him than she did at the others. As time went by, it happened one day that two fleas hopped into the princess's palm. Well, 
She was as quick as lightning and held them fast in her hand. She took the two fleas to a pot containing lard and put them in there so that they would grow big and fat. She was right indeed, and hardly a year had gone by when the two fleas had grown so huge that the hide was big enough to make a pair of shoes. The princess made up her mind. She summoned the butcher, had the fleas skinned, ordered the shoemaker to tan the hides and the bootmaker to make her a pair of fine boots. She had it announced far and wide that she would marry the man who could tell her what animal's hide her boots were made out of. The princes came flocking again from far-flung corners of the world. They were all fine young men in their prime. They lined up in the courtyard and started guessing what animal's hide the princess's shoes could be made out of. But none of them got it right. Then the prince the princess had taken a liking to dressed in a beggar's rags and sneaked into the princess's bedchamber where he hid in the night, hoping to hear what the princess would tell her maid about the boots. He could not have been more right. The princess had a good laugh at all the silly answers she had been hearing all day and said to her maid, You'll see, nobody will ever know that my boots have been made out of flea skin. That was enough for the prince. The next day, he mingled in his beggar's clothes among the princes and when his turn came, he uttered, Your Royal Highness, your boots are made out of flea skin. The princess went white as a sheet, shivered like a leaf, but did not wish to go back on her word, so she said, You're right, beggar, so from this moment forth, I'm your wedded wife, till death do us part. All right, my lovely young wife, but take off your nice silk clothes and put on beggar's rags. Then we'll make a perfect match. The haughty princess donned a beggar woman's clothes and accompanied her husband to a dirty little hut on the outskirts of the village. As if all that had not been enough, she even had to beg with her husband day in, day out. On top of it all, she even had to make a fire and cook dinner for her husband as best she could with what little she had. To make matters worse, a farm labourer came and shouted to her in a loud voice, Hey you, beggar woman, go at once to hoe the land on the prince's estate. What else could the poor princess do? She went off as she had been ordered, shedding many a tear on the way. Her husband then made straight for the palace. There he donned his bright royal clothes and walked out among the labourers. It was his fields that the beggar woman had been sent to. The prince kept on encouraging and praising the labourers, but scolded and humiliated his wife, saying that he had never seen such a bad farmhand, although the poor woman was sweating with the effort she was making. Dinner time came, all the labourers were seated at a big table, and silver cutlery was put next to the plate of each. The prince still had not had enough. He wanted his haughty wife never to forget the experience, so he told another woman labourer to slip a silver spoon into the beggar woman's pocket. There was a lot of toing and froing after dinner when the servants found a silver spoon was missing. They went through the pockets of all the labourers and found the silver spoon in the beggar woman's pocket. In vain did she swear that she had not stolen it. She was put in a dungeon. By this time, the lesson had been enough. Hardly had the door of the dungeon been locked than the prince had it opened again and walked in to his young wife. There he gently took her by the hand, led her up to the palace and said to her, All right, your crying days are over. Put on your nice silk clothes again I've put on mine too, for I was the beggar, you married. Do you see now, my dear? Well, to cut a long story short, they made up and started a new life together that was a joy to see for everyone. I saw it, make sure you do too.
folk tales. Cinderella. Once upon a time, there lived a poor man, and he had a daughter. Next door, there lived a widow, who had two daughters. The widow wanted the man to marry her, so she sent word to him that if he married her, she would treat his daughter like her own. The poor man thought very hard for a long time, and finally made up his mind to marry the widow. The stepmother always treated her stepdaughter like dirt, and never went out of her way to cause her sorrow and pain. When Sunday came, the widow and her two daughters prepared to go to church. The stepmother said to Cinderella, "Here, while we're away at church, pick out the peas from the ashes, cook them, and serve them." The stepmother and her two daughters went off to church, and Cinderella was left behind. And she was about to begin to pick the peas out of the ashes when a flock of doves flew in through the window. They dropped three nuts and set about separating the peas from the ashes. The three nuts were sent by Cinderella's mother. While the doves were picking out the peas, God descended and ordered the girl to go to church. But to leave when the priest raised the sacraments, Cinderella donned the silver dress and had a look at her reflection in the well before she left. When she saw herself, she was so pleased with what she saw that she almost fell into the well. The service was attended by the prince too. As soon as he caught a glimpse of Cinderella, his heart was captured. He couldn't take his eyes off her, but when the priest raised the sacraments, Cinderella left the church. The prince followed her right away, but the girl vanished into thin air, and the prince could see no trace of her anywhere. Back at home, the girl took off her dress. The food was ready because God had prepared it for her. The stepmother came home with her two daughters. You'll never guess what we saw at church. There's no one as beautiful as that girl in the whole wide world. Then they told her what they had seen. I saw it too. How come? From the mulberry tree. That was all the stepmother needed. She immediately had the mulberry tree cut down. The next Sunday, she mixed the lentils into the ashes and ordered Cinderella to separate the lentils from the ashes, then to cook them and serve them. The three women left her alone again. Then God descended with His angels and ordered them to do Cinderella's chores. He told the girl to get ready and do the same as she had done the Sunday before. This time, Cinderella donned the golden dress. As she was setting off, she looked in the well and was enchanted by what she saw there. The prince was already expecting her. When the priest raised the sacraments, Cinderella left the mass. She vanished into thin air again. When Cinderella arrived home again, all the food was ready because God had prepared it all. You'll never believe what we saw. I saw it too from the top of the well. The stepmother had it cut down at once. The third Sunday, the stepmother mixed flour into the ashes for Cinderella to separate. It was God again that did the job for her. And Cinderella donned the diamond dress and went off to mass, but not without looking in the well first. She couldn't believe her eyes; she was so dazzling. When the priest raised the sacraments, she got up to leave. But the prince had had the threshold of the church covered in glue, so one of her shoes got stuck. The prince picked up the shoe and set off on horseback to look for its owner. At home, the stepmother's two daughters were again boasting of what they had seen. Again, Cinderella told them that she had seen it from the roof of the house. Upon that, the mother had the roof of the house demolished. 
the prince went through the whole village. He had all the young maidens in every house try on the shoe, but it did not fit any of them. When he reached the stepmother's house, Cinderella was made to hide under the wash tub while they waited for the prince. The girls tried on the shoe, but it did not fit either of them, despite their mother having carved bits off their ankles. Then all of a sudden, the cockerel began to crow in the yard. The pretty girl is under the wash tub. The pretty girl is under the wash tub. The stepmother heard this and began to chase the cockerel, but the prince heard it too. The pretty girl was indeed under the wash tub. She tried on the shoe, which fitted her perfectly. Then the prince said to Cinderella, Love of my life, I'm yours and you're mine forever and a day. This time it was the stepmother's two daughters who were left behind. And this is the end of my tale. Hungarian folk tales. The wolf's joke. Once upon a time, there lived a man called Uncle George Fox. This Uncle George Fox had a horse, a sheep and a pig. But he did not give them anything to eat all winter. They were so skinny by springtime that their bones were sticking out. He ushered them through the gate and said, Off you go, you'll make good food for wolves. And why didn't you grow fat in winter time? But how could they if he didn't feed them? This was overheard by a wolf. When the horse walked past him, the wolf said, Stop right now and let me eat you. That's what your owner said. You may eat me if you will, but can't you see I'm all skin and bone? What is it that you want to eat on me? If you let me go on my way, I'll grow fat upon the hillside during the summer, and then you'll have a real feast on me. Well, the wolf let the horse go, and off it went. Then the pig came, the wolf said. Stop right now and let me eat you. That's what your owner said. What is it that you want to eat on me? I'm nothing but skin and bones. If you let me go, I'll grow fat upon the hillside and return with six piglets. That will make a real feast for you. The wolf let the pig go too, and the pig went off. Then the sheep came. The wolf said, stop right now and let me eat you. That's what your owner said. What is it that you want to eat on me? I'm nothing but skin and bones. If you let me go, I'll grow fat upon the hillside and make a real feast for you when I return. The wolf let it go too and did nothing all summer, but wait for the three animals to return as they said they would. He lounged about, moving from bush to bush all summer. Autumn came and one day he saw the pig trot along with six piglets. Six lovely piglets. The wolf saw them from under a bush. He rejoiced at the thought of the feast he was about to have. He emerged from under the bush and went to greet them. Jolly good you didn't deceive me. I've been looking forward to eating you all this time and now I'll have my feast. Then the pig said, if I had meant to deceive you, I wouldn't have come this way. But there's one small problem. What is it? There was no one up on the hillside and so the piglets haven't been christened yet. They ought to be christened first because it's not good to eat them like this. Where can they be christened? Here in the village. The priest will do it. Oh, all right then. Take them to the priest, have them christened and bring them back. The pig set off with the piglets in tow. Then the pig turned back and said to the wolf, Come here, let me whisper in your ear what the name of each one will be. You'd better know. The wolf did as bid, holding its ear close to the pig's mouth. 
The pig was in high spirits, grabbed the wolf's ear and began to tug away at it. The six piglets followed suit and almost tore the wolf to pieces. He could hardly manage to get away. They then went off and the sheep came. I hope you won't deceive me, the pig did. If I had wanted to deceive you, I wouldn't have come this way. Stop then and let me eat you. At least you'll make a good feast for me. You may eat me if you will, but there's a slight problem. What is it? You know something, if you begin to chew me, it will hurt me, but it will also give you a toothache. Stand in that hole, hold your mouth wide open so I can hop into it and you can just swallow me. The wolf stood in the hole and opened his mouth. The sheep prepared itself, took a nice long run and hit the wolf so hard that it somersaulted like a ball. Then the sheep leapt over it and ran off. Then came the horse. The wolf stood in front of it and said, at least you had better not deceive me. Two animals have already done so. If I had wanted to deceive you, I wouldn't have come this way. All right, stop then and let me eat you. You may eat me if you will, but there's a tiny problem. What is it? A maiden is getting married in the next village and I've been asked to take the bride around. When that's over, I'll come here and you can eat me. Well, I wouldn't mind seeing that for myself. I mean, how you take the bride around. Come and see for yourself. How can I hop on my back? So the wolf sat on the horse's back and the horse took it into town. A man in the village was known by the name of Uncle Andrew Duncan. In summertime, there were always men playing cards in his yard. They were playing cards as usual when the horse passed in front of the gate with the wolf on his back. The people saw the wolf on the back of the horse and began to shout, Look there, a wolf on the back of a horse! Look there, a wolf on the back of a horse! Each one of them reached for a stick or an axe. The horse slowed down so that the people could catch up with it. This they did, and the poor wolf had a hard job trying to get away without being battered to death. There was a man in the village called Uncle Pete Kalen. He was gathering wood in the forest when he saw the wolf approaching. So Uncle Pete Kalen swiftly hid behind a big tree so the wolf wouldn't see him. The wolf happened to sit down under that very tree, keeping his eye on the village in the distance. Then he began to say to himself, It serves me right. I was so foolish. I wish someone would hit me right now. Uncle Pete Kalen hit him so hard with the axe that the wolf was almost not dead. <laughs> Heavens, the wolf said. It was only meant to be a joke. want his daughter to marry. Once upon a time, there lived a king, a very rich king, in a castle. He had a beautiful daughter. He loved her so much that he did not want even to let her leave the castle, lest someone should take her from him. One day, however, the princess begged her father to let her walk out a little. He allowed her to do so, but not for long, so that no harm would come to her. As she was walking through the flowery meadow, she realised that a young man was approaching her. It was the son of the neighbouring country's king. Both of them were so good-looking that they fell in love right away. They agreed that the prince would go home and set out at once to call on the girl's father and ask for her hand in marriage. The princess went home and told her father where she had walked and whom she had met. Her father grew terribly angry and nervous that someone might take away his precious daughter. 
he told his daughter that he'd rather put a curse on her forever than give her to the prince. He sent a messenger to the other king, telling him not to come and ask for the hand of his daughter. But if he still wished to come, he should do so with an army that could defeat him and take his castle. The prince had already set off to the king when the messenger arrived. The king gathered his soldiers and sent them with his son. The army set off. The other king's castle was high up on a hill from where they noticed the approaching army sent by the enemy king. The king called together all his men to defend the castle against the enemy. When the approaching army reached the hill, they sent a messenger to ask the king to give his daughter without further ado. The king sent back a message that he would not do so for anything in the world. They attacked the castle and lay siege to it. Then they noticed that there was no one on the inside fighting them. The lord of the castle said he did not wish his men to die, so anyone who wanted to leave was free to do so. When the army attacked the castle, all the men inside left through underground passages, leaving only the king and his daughter behind. The princess said she would not leave because she was so in love with the prince that there was nothing she wanted more than to be his wife. The father begged her in vain, but she would not leave. Then her father cast a spell on her, turning the princess into three types of animals. The spell could only be broken if a young man kissed the three animals in turn. Meanwhile, the enemy had managed to make its way into the castle. They searched for the princess but could not find her anywhere. The prince was desperate. He didn't know what to do. He let his men go home and asked them to tell his father that he would not go home until he managed to find the princess and take her with him. He looked for her high and low, but in vain. He went out of the castle and wandered in the forest. He sat down and was thinking what to do when an old woman approached him. Dear Prince, the old lady said, I know what your problem is and I also know how to solve it. The old woman was no less than a witch. Tell me, old lady, I'll give you anything in exchange, but I must know the answer. The princess will come out of the castle every moonlit night. And whatever shape she comes in, rest assured, it is her. You must kiss these creatures three times in a row, and then the spell on the princess will be broken. The prince, who was prepared to do anything, waited for nightfall in the hope of seeing the princess. As the moon came up in the sky, he saw a little bunny rabbit hopping in front of the castle. He took a few steps in its direction, but the bunny did not move. He embraced it and kissed it three times, and the bunny vanished. No sooner had it disappeared than a big lion walked through the gate of the castle. Although the prince got cold feet, he remembered the old woman's words. So he approached the lion, embraced it and kissed it three times, and the lion did him no harm. Then it disappeared too. Hardly had the lion gone when the prince saw the castle surrounded by flames. A seven-headed dragon emerged, spitting fire from all of its mouths and lighting up the nearby forest. The prince took fright. This surely can't be the princess. But the dragon approached him relentlessly, showing him the huge keys in its hands as if to spur him on and say, Never fear, sweetheart. Then the prince went up to it, embraced it and kissed it three times, upon which the dragon turned into the princess. They both rejoiced and she gave him the keys. Now I am yours and with me all the wealth in this castle. They entered the castle and she showed him all the riches. Luckily there were six horses there, so they put them before a carriage and drove to the prince's father, the king. There they held their wedding right away, yet the bride did not seem very happy. The prince asked her what the problem was. I can't be happy until my father is here beside me. The prince said to her, Well, we'll find him somewhere. They didn't have to look for him for too long, as he was already on his way there. He learned that the prince had broken the spell cast on his daughter, so he came to see her. The old man was led to his daughter. They saw each other, embraced and rejoiced upon finding each other at long last. 
the old man made his peace with his daughter, and the wedding feast went on and on and on.